Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Engaging New Voters, How Nonprofits Are Closing the Voter Participation Gap. My name is Caitlin Donnelly. I'm the Education and Engagement Coordinator here at Nonprofit Vote. Before we dive in, I have a couple of housekeeping items. First, we encourage audience participation. So use the chat box or tweet your question using hashtag NPVWebinar at NPVote. We'll pause in the middle and end of the webinar to answer your questions. Second, everyone registered for this webinar will receive a follow-up email with links you can use to download today's PowerPoint presentation, download the audio file, or watch the webinar on Nonprofit Vote's YouTube channel. Today we are talking about engaging new voters. Nonprofit Vote's latest report on the impact that nonprofits can have on client and community turnout when they conduct voter outreach. Our guests will discuss who nonprofits are reaching and the best practices that make nonprofit voter engagements successful. If you're unfamiliar with us, Nonprofit Vote partners with America's nonprofits to help the people they serve participate and vote. We are a leading source of training, materials, and other resources for nonprofits doing nonpartisan voter engagement work. We are fortunate to be joined on the webinar today by Brian Miller, Executive Director of Nonprofit Vote, and Emily Shamsi Dean. Uh, Brian has a background in organizing and nonprofit management. He served as the Executive Director of Tennesseans for Fair Taxation and then United for a Fair Economy before joining Nonprofit Vote in 2014. Brian has worked to bring the voter engagement strategies of Nonprofit Vote to scale, leveraging new resources, documenting the impact of its work, and forging new partnerships. Thanks for being with us today, Brian. And I will now turn it over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Caitlin. And um, thank you all for joining this webinar. And it's an important discussion, um, as many folks, I'm sure, agree. Um, and I want to start by really getting clear about what the problem is and make, you know, defining the problem. And you know, when you think about the challenges to our democracy, particularly challenges to elections and the health of our electoral process, there's really two dynamics going on. There's low voter turnout overall, but then there's gaps in voter turnout. And when I reference the low turnout overall, of course, you know, you, you hear about, you know, maybe a couple of years ago we had one of the lowest turnouts we'd had in, a, in an election in some time. Um, generally speaking, though, in presidential election years, um, we generally have about 60% of voting eligible people uh, population turnout to vote. In midterm elections, like the one we're about to come up to, it typically hovers in the mid-30s, upwards of 40% of voting eligible uh, populations turnout. And of course, in, in municipal elections, it can be 20% or less. And that's really a reflection of overall turnout. And, and while that is important, I think of, of greater concern to many of us are the gaps in voter turnout. Um, because what, what, that's what really distorts our democracy. It's when entire segments of the population are underrepresented. Then the electorate no longer represents what the general public looks like. It, it, it's not a representative sample of America. And so um, in the 2016 election, for example, um, you know, if you look at it along the lines of race, about now this is census data, so it's not the voting eligible, but nonetheless, about 65% of white voters uh, turned out, about 60% of black voters turned out, and un just under 50% of Latino and AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islander uh, uh, voters turned out to the polls. So there's very significant gaps uh, along the lines of race. Um, and if you look at it along the lines of age, you see very similar things. And that's, of course, a big part of the discussion we're having here today with the Engaging New Voters Report. Uh, among those uh, 65 and older, roughly 70% uh, turned out to vote. Um, among those under 30 years old, only 46% turned out to vote. And again, this is a presidential election year. Um, this is the 2016 data. So we have huge gaps along the lines of age, along the lines of race. We also have, and if we went further, they're along the lines of income, education level, and so forth, which means the, the, the people who are getting elected and the decisions that are being made 
are, are being made by a skewed set of the public. And that distorts the democracy, it distorts the policy options available to legislators, and it distorts our public dialogues. And so that's a deep and important concern of nonprofit vote, um, and of course many of the partners that we work with. And to a certain degree, public policies do drive uh, this, this dynamic. Um, we publish a report every couple of years called America Goes to the Polls. Um, you can find it on our website, which ranks all 50 states in voter turnout. And one of the things that report shows is that, yes, to a degree, policies can drive turnout. States with election day registration, for example, generally have turnout rates that are seven percentage points higher than non-election day registration day states, or states without election day registration. So there's a distinct seven-point advantage uh, in voter turnout among states that have that policy that allow you to register to vote on election day itself. Um, we also look at things like automatic voter registration, which is fairly new, um, all mail ballots and, and other things. So these can drive turnouts, but here's the real kicker, is that even in the most voter-friendly states, states that have election day registration, states that don't require photo IDs, states that have early voting, online registration, and so forth, even in those states, there's very significant gaps in voter turnout drawn along the lines of race, drawn along the lines of age, uh, and drawn along the lines of income, which tells us something, that, it's, that something more than voting policy is driving this. Um, and that gets to where the real challenge is and what we hope to address with this report and with the work of the nonprofits is that, um, get to this next slide here, so that it's really about who is being contacted about elections. And there's a dynamic that goes on where uh, this is uh, some data from Pew, uh, Pew Research Center, which looks at who was contacted about the elections in 2016. Um, and among those 65 and older, over 50, or 56% roughly said that they had received a call, contact, mailer, or, or some kind of communication from the campaigns about the elections. Um, among those under 30 years old, that number drops all the way to 37%. And we see the same thing uh, drawn along the lines of uh, race. Um, uh, Latino decisions poll and Asian American decisions uh, election eve poll show very similar trends where um, only 64% or sorry, 64% of Latinos and 57% of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders report not being contacted. So you can flip those numbers around to see who was contacted. And so, there, so the reality is we have a segment of the population that's not being contacted, and that's being driven by the economics of political campaigns. And that's what I think we really need to understand is that in this country, we rely primarily upon political parties and candidates to contact voters, to get them registered, to get them to the polls. The problem with that is that um, political campaigns and candidates are driven by a fundamentally different economics. They've only got so much money, they only have so much time, and they've got an election in six months, nine months, that's a win or lose proposition. And so they're gonna focus the money that they have and the time that they have on contacting people with a history of voting. They're not gonna spend a lot of resources contacting people who haven't shown a history of showing up at the polls. And of course, the problem with that is that that creates a self-fulfilling uh, scenario. It it's basically feeds into a negative feedback loop. So people don't vote. Right? There are certain segments of the population, which we talked about earlier, that haven't shown a history of voting. And because of that, they're labeled as unlikely voters. And so when the candidates are organizing their campaigns, they're pulling down the voter files, and they're not going to spend a lot of time contacting people who are unlikely voters. They're going to focus all their resources on folks who have a history of voting. And so what that does is that creates this negative feedback loop where um, that basically reinforces itself. And this is a fundamental reason why democracy will not fix itself. You know, as long as we rely on campaigns and candidates, this is just going to self-perpetuate and these gaps are going to continue for generations to come. It's, the, it's basically political campaigns have the wrong economics and the wrong motivators to close these gaps. And so that's where, you know, we with this work, we look at the impact of nonprofits and what nonprofits can do. And so nonprofits have a fundamentally different motivator. You know, our interest is in, um, you know, one, we're, interested in, we're actually interested in ensuring that the communities that we serve are voting in elections. 
Um, and, and these are communities, in many cases, it's the very people who are being passed over by political campaigns. And so, and, and of course, nonprofits have a lot of other advantages that make us well suited to doing this work. Nonprofits have trust of the community that we serve. We have uh, uh, deep roots in the communities that we serve. We have the cultural competency to work with the communities that we serve. And again, the communities that we serve are the very people who are being passed over in the political campaign. So when nonprofits begin to engage, something, something really beautiful starts to happen. Um, people start to vote, for one. And as people start to vote, they're labeled as a likely voter. All of a sudden, they start showing up in the voter rolls and in the voter files as someone with a history of voting. And as they show up with that history of voting, then campaigns start to making, making contact. And that's really how we break this pattern. Um, and then it becomes a positive feedback loop because once people start showing a history of voting, then they start getting the kind of contact from campaigns and from parties and others to really reinforce and fuel a positive feedback loop. And, um, that's, and that's when you hear people talk about the habit-forming nature, that voting is habit-forming. It's true, and there's a lot of research that documents it. Part of the reason voting is habit-forming is internal, right? People just psychologically identify as a voter. It's, it's cultural. It's something that you, you do uh, because of peer pressure, the communities you're in. But part of it is also because of this feedback loop, because once you start voting, there's an external dynamic, which is that you start getting that contact. And so with the work of nonprofit vote, as Caitlin said earlier, you know, we work primarily, um, we work with nonprofits all across the country to help them engage the communities that they serve in voting elections. So every couple of years we do this study, um, and in some cases we do it in odd years as well. But um, essentially what we do is we, we partner with, in this case, we partnered with 122 nonprofits across nine states. Uh, these nonprofits include food banks, they include community health centers, uh, cultural organizations, CDCs, um, just a broad section of mostly human service nonprofits that are set up and doing voter registration and voter engagement with the communities that they serve. So um, what, in, in most cases, what that looks like is in the lobby of the community health center, maybe they're tabling a voter registration booth and as people come in, they offer people the opportunity to register. If they're already registered, then they offer them the opportunity to sign a pledge to vote card. Same thing in food pantries and other, other venues that are part of this project. And of course, we also had a number of civic engagement anchors uh, uh, at the state level, about uh, 10 or so groups that we worked with that helped train these 120 or so local nonprofits. In all, the program uh, engaged about uh, 39,000 uh, voter contacts that we made. Um, and, but for the purpose of this study, we really wanted to look at the impact that nonprofits had on engaging young voters. And so we really focused narrowly on those who are under 30 years of age, which represented about 6,000 of the voters that were contacted because we also limited it down to a select number of study counties. We didn't include every single county that we worked in uh, for purposes of the study, but we nonetheless focused on these study counties. Um, and in order to do the analysis, we basically, we, we were able to take the, the folks that registered to vote or signed a pledge to vote card at these nonprofits, we matched it with the voter files, and were able to document what percentage of them actually turned out and voted. And then for comparison, we have a comparison set of data, which is basically a demographically similar set of voters, young voters, in the same study states to show how, they, how this population would have expected to have voted had we done nothing. And so the first thing that we looked at in the study is the demographics of who nonprofits reached. And so as you look at this, the red bar here is the comparison group. This is young voters broadly in the study states and study counties. The blue bar here is the young voters that were engaged at the nonprofit service providers. And as you can see, um, uh, within, within young black voters were 1.6, or the voters that nonprofits engaged were a little over one and a half times as likely to be black voters. Um, they were about twice as likely to be Latino, and they were about half as likely to be uh, white. So from a racial makeup, we know we're reaching the audience that we need to reach. 
Um, we also took a look, I don't have this graph, but we also took a look at the overall population, that 39,000 that we voted, that we registered and are engaged, and they were, the overall population was more likely to be people of color. They were more likely to be young. They were more likely to be lower income, and they were more likely to be women. Uh, that's generally who nonprofits are most more likely to engage. And again, in many cases, these are the populations that we need to engage if we're going to shift that public dialogue, if we're going to shift that gap in voter turnout that I was talking about earlier. And so as we look at that gap, and this is where the real promising news comes out. So among the young nonprofit voters, again, the young nonprofit voters are the blue graphs here. The red is the comparison set. So among the young voters that we engaged, 61% turned out to vote. Among the comparison group, it was a little over 55%. And roughly speaking, basically what, what the nonprofit voters had a 5.7 percentage point advantage in turnout over the comparison group. Uh, if you notice the math doesn't add up there, that's because of a rounding thing. Um, but the long and short is that what this tells us is that nonprofits have a very, very positive impact on turnout when they engage the communities that they serve. And this is consistent with uh, studies that we've done in prior years as well. And we looked at it also by race. And so among every demographic group that we looked at, um, you know, basically the, those, the community that was engaged by nonprofits turned out at a higher rate, generally five to six percentage points higher than the comparison group. Um, you'll also notice here that the graphs generally reflect those earlier trends I was talking about. That white voter turnout tends to be highest. Uh, black voter turnout has in the last, there was a couple of election cycles there where black voter turnout matched white voter turnout. Um, and this is a gap that's actually closed over many decades. It used to be that black voter turnout lagged about 20 points behind white voter turnout as the Latino currently do. Um, but that has gradually narrowed over many over a few decades to where black voter turnout almost matches white voter turnout, not quite. Um, but as you can see, the Latino voter turnout is still 20 points behind, as is the Asian American voter turnout overall. But nonetheless, among every group that the nonprofits engaged, they turned out at a higher rate. We also looked at this by gender. Um, and so both groups, young men and young women engaged by nonprofits, turned out at significantly higher rates than their counterparts. Um, now, many folks might scratch their heads looking at this graph. This is something a lot of folks don't know, but the reality is, is women generally outvote men uh, in, in most recent elections. If you look at it by uh, across age groups, it, it's different though. Among older generations, men outvote women. Among pretty much most voters under 40 or so, women tend to outvote men, um, which is a broader uh, dynamic that goes on that's, out, that's outside of the study. But among both groups that were engaged by nonprofits, they both turned out, and this once again shows that when nonprofits engage the communities we serve, we can see a significant increase in voter turnout along those demographics. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, we had a challenge uh, previously in that um, th one of the things when we do this work at nonprofits, the reality is a lot of the folks that we engage are already registered. So what do you do? Well, we always encourage folks to do voter pledge cards um, because you want that second ask. You don't want to let that opportunity pass you up. And it's not just because it's a second ask, but because it's incredibly effective. And this is what we found when we looked at the voter pledge cards. And that was just a huge bump in turnout among those who signed a voter pledge card. So in this case, among the nonprofit voters who came into a nonprofit service agency, whether it was a food pantry, a community health center, or other venue, essentially um, 76 or 76.6 uh, percentage of those voters turned out at the polls which is a 14-point advantage over their counterparts of other registered young voters in the same states. And this is something we've seen in, um, in some of our other studies in prior years as well. So it's very, very effective to use the voter pledge cards. Um, the bump in turnout for uh, already registered, uh, the other turnout is a little more complicated because in, in the case of those who aren't registered, it's really hard to get a comparison because the reality is if a person is not registered, their voter turnout rate is going to be zero. 
so that population, we really, it's, it's hard to talk about what bump is because the reality is for those who are already registered or who are not registered, who are registered at, an, at a nonprofit agency, their turnout advantage hypothetically was bigger because they went from zero. But for purposes of this study, we compared all the population that we engaged to voters who were already registered. Um, again, to show the impact that nonprofits have, that when nonprofits engage the communities they serve, they do turn out at significantly higher rates than their counterparts. And I think that's the big takeaway of this, this report, is that, as I mentioned earlier, we have gaps in voter turnout which are distorting our democracy. Those gaps will not close by themselves. We need a third party actor to intervene. And nonprofits have the trust, they have the competency, and as this data shows, they reach the right audience, and when they engage those audience, those folks start voting. And that's how we change that broader dynamic and start to narrow those voter participation gaps. And I'm going to turn it back over to Caitlin and uh, Elena. Caitlin? Thank you, Brian. So we do have a couple questions so far, and I encourage everyone to please keep chatting us your questions. Um, over the chat feature. Um, so I have a couple questions now, and Emily, I also invite you to speak on these questions if you have anything to add in. Uh, so Renee asks, what about religious-based nonprofits versus non-religious? So I think uh, Brian or Emily, is, is there any research or any experience that you have about the differences between those kinds of nonprofits? I'll say that we, did not, we do not have a big enough data set to segregate and look at whether, one's more, whether one is more impactful than the other. Um, but I can say that religious groups were included in this mix. Some of the food pantries were faith-based food pantries tied with, you know, a Catholic social services or a Lutheran uh, social services agency. So some of the nonprofits in the mix were faith-based nonprofits. Um, but we don't have enough data to say that whether they're more effective or less effective than non-religious groups. They're just all part of the same study. Okay. Uh, and then uh, a somewhat similar question. Um, Cindy's asking if we've looked at di the disability community specifically. Uh, again, I don't think that, you know, some of the family services and some of the agencies that are, that are part of this study do work with the disability community. Um, and so some of the services that are being offered here uh, are included in the study. Again, we just, we just don't have enough data to disaggregate. Um, we would like to start doing that in the future. Some of the things that we are looking at are, um, and we do get to it a little bit in the qualitative study and the analysis, um, but it's, the data is still uh, not enough to say, is a community health center more effective than a food pantry, more effective than, you know, what are the places where you can get the biggest throughput? Um, all we know is that, broadly speaking, these nonprofit service agencies, whether they're dealing with hunger, whether they're dealing with housing or, or health, or whether they're a faith-based or not, um, are having a very positive impact on voter turnout when they engage the communities that they serve. Excellent. This is, this is Emily. If I, could just, oh, yeah. Please do. Sorry, if I could just add to that, I think we have, um, in Colorado, we have partnered with a couple of groups that um, work with, with folks with disabilities. And, you know, part of what we see, to Brian's point earlier, around the trust that these groups tend to have with the communities that they serve, that that really becomes the foundation and the anchor for how successful um, programs really are when it comes to, to the voting work. And we know that, in our experience, um, those groups have, have been very successful with their communities because there's a um, foundation and a, a existing relationship of trust, and they also are able to communicate um, both to us but also to their communities around um, some of the unique um, you know, issues, challenges um, that might exist when it comes to voting. Um, so I just wanted to add that piece as well. Thank you, Emily. Uh, we have a question about, we have a couple questions about pledge cards. 
uh, one question is about if we've seen any negative feedback when using the word pledge with young people between the ages of 18 to 24. I have not, um, but I will defer to Emily. I don't know, your, your folks might be more directly contacted with the work that was happening on the ground. I don't know if you've ever heard that. That is not something that I have heard, no. I, uh, Linda, if you're still on, I would love to hear more about uh, your concerns with that word, uh, but it sounds, I, I, I was surprised to, to read that there might be something, but maybe you can teach us a little something about the connotation that word might have with some of our uh, younger, newer voters. Uh, we have a question from Michael asking, for the pledge cards, was it examined if the difference in participation was self-selection, i.e., people who are going to vote anyway are the only ones who will sign pledge cards? That is a very good question. And this is not, I should say, this was not a randomized controlled group. And I think to do the kind of uh, piece you're talking about, you need to have that randomized controlled uh, rigor of an experiment. So in this case, we simply had comparison populations. So it is very possible that it was skewed by that self-selection process. But I should say, backing up, the studies that have been done with, with randomized controlled do show a positive impact. Maybe not 14 points positive, but they do show a significantly positive impact um, uh, in turnout for pledge cards. But our study didn't do that kind of randomized controlled. Okay, so Kurt is asking, what do you do with the pledge card? Where do they go? Do they get mailed somewhere, posted to a bulletin board? Basically, um, and Emily can speak to this because I believe you all did it there in Colorado, um, that we do follow up with everyone who signed a pledge card. Emily, do you want to um, answer that one? Sure. So what we do in Colorado is that that information from the pledge cards um, gets put into our get out the vote efforts. Um, that way everyone who we have contacted both through voter registrations but also through the pledge cards gets rolled into that GOTV program so they do receive um, some additional resources as we get closer to Election Day. Great. Thanks, Emily. Um, Keep your questions coming. I have a couple that I'm going to hold on to um, for a little later on in the webinar. Uh, so let's transition into best practices. So nonprofit vote, as uh, Brian explained, uh, we did this research. We were in the field for six weeks after the November 2016 elections collect qualitative information from participating agency staff, volunteers, and leaders on the tactics, challenges, and success factors in their voter outreach activities. So not just who were nonprofits reaching, but actually how they were doing this. Uh, we conducted field interviews with state partners who coordinated the work of participating agencies in their state or metro area. And our analysis examined differences between top and bottom performers, that is, agencies that made the most number of voter contacts as compared to those that made the least number of voter contacts. And so we have Emily Shamsi, excuse me, Emily Shamsi Dean with us, and she was one of those uh, state partners. And she's going to take us through those best practices and share her insight from her work with nonprofits on the ground in Colorado in 2016. Uh, Emily is the Community Engagement Manager at Community Resource Center, where she manages the Participation Project, Root Causes Network, and facilitates statewide trainings. Emily has worked in the nonprofit sector for 15 years in HIV AIDS education and prevention as a direct service provider. Uh, she's managed a statewide training program supporting domestic violence organizations, and ran a statewide leadership development program for those working to advance social justice issues in Colorado. Most recently, she was an adjunct faculty at the University of Denver in the Graduate of School of Schoolwork, teaching social welfare policy analysis and practice. Emily is committed to working collaboratively with the nonprofit sector to increase their capacity to affect long-term systemic change. Thank you so much for joining us, Emily. 
Thank you. Um, I am thrilled to be here. This is definitely one of my favorite topics. Um, so I wanted to share just a little bit about who we are. So Community Resource Center is essentially a statewide nonprofit capacity building organization. Um, we do a lot of work all across the state just helping um, our nonprofit sector do their good work better. Um, one of the things that we have done very recently is adopted the Participation Project. The Participation Project um, has been around since 2010. Um, it was adopted by CRC in 2016. So while we are relatively new at CRC and the structure, um, we have been on the ground and doing this work um, for a while. So the Participation Project provides guidance, training, and support to human service nonprofits um, to roll out nonpartisan voter engagement efforts with their clients and with their communities. Um, I wanted to highlight one thing, which is that based on, based on our list and based on what some of the things that we have learned about the people that our nonprofits have helped to register to vote, is that 93% of them are what we consider to be unique. And that means that, um, again, sort of based on, on the data, that that means that 93% of the folks that our nonprofits help to register um, were not contacted or asked or engaged by other sort of traditional um, voting campaigns. And so to Brian's point earlier, that for us is such an important piece of information because it tells us that we really are reaching folks um, who are in that gap, who represent that gap, um, and that may not be getting contacted by other folks. And one of the things that we talk about with our nonprofits during our, our training is, is the fact that there is a, a real responsibility around, um, around the fact that they may be the only person asking um, you know, the client in front of them to vote, to be engaged, to have a voice in this regard. And there's something that is so powerful um, about that role that nonprofits can play. So wanting to take a little bit of time to, to talk, as Caitlin said, about some of the best practices. So we have, an, in Colorado, through the Participation Project, um, we have reached over 22,000 voters. We have worked with over 40 partner organizations. Um, and across maybe probably we're looking at 25 counties in Colorado so far. Um, so the reach is, is, really, um, is really incredible. One of the things that we have learned from our partner organizations is that when there is staff buy-in, they're way more likely uh, to be successful in their efforts. What we do with the Participation Project is we provide all of the training, the support, the materials, um, all of the sort of big back-end program coordination. But at the end of the day, we rely on the staff and the volunteers inside of those nonprofits to be doing the work, to be the ones making the ask. Um, and so if there's not staff buy-in to do that, then it's difficult. One, it's difficult. Um, from the perspective of, and we've, we've had this experience before as well, which is that there's staff inside that are not bought in to voting in general, right? That they actually have some reservations, um, questions, they're just not quite convinced that their vote matters. So when you have that type of um, sort of mentality within the nonprofit, it's going to be hard for them to make an effective ask to somebody else. So part of what we have done is making sure that a part of our training is spending quite a bit of time of actually building staff buy-in um, as part of our training process um, so we can sort of head on address um, some of those concerns or hesitations that, that folks might have. When we have organizations where staff is, is committed, that really understands the power and the importance of doing this work, um, they by far are the most successful because that really translates into how then they are able to engage their clients. So it's both a, 
how do they actually organize the work within their organizations, right? Making sure that um, you know events are happening, or making sure that um, their staff are making the ask where they have agreed to. Um, but it's also about the way that the organization can translate the excitement and the importance um, to their to their clients and to their communities. One of the other things that is important is, is partnerships. And so while we, um, you know, as a participation project, are partnering with human service nonprofits across the state, you know, there are some limits to what it is that we can do. And so being able to tap in to the other expertise that is already happening in the state has been really critical for us. So two examples are we have worked with the Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition. They are our state's essentially leading experts when it comes to voting rights for people um, who have been involved in the, in the criminal justice system. And so while we do you know, a, a bit around eligibility um, based on Colorado law about that in our training, um, they really are the experts. And so we've partnered with them to have them come in and be a part of our training to make sure um, that all of our partners are not just receiving like comprehensive good information, but that this is something that is really important because the communities that we work with oftentimes have a higher rate um, of being involved in the criminal justice system. So being really clear and understanding the ins and outs of how that law works in Colorado has been an important piece for us. Um, but again, we're not the experts in that, they really are. So they come in, it's also a great way for us to um, you know, help strengthen and expose their organization um, to some other nonprofits that, that may not have that connection. The other example is that there is an organization that come, uh, once we get a little bit closer to election day, they actually do um, statewide voter protection. Um, and so they have a hotline, they produce materials, and it really, again, it's all nonpartisan, but they just want to make sure that people really understand their rights, that they understand how the process works, um, that folks can, you know, troubleshoot questions or concerns. And so we work with them um, to help distribute their materials. We share out their hotline so all of our partners can make sure that their clients and their communities have access to those things as well. So those types of partnerships I think have, um, have really strengthened um, the work that we're able to do. And again, you know, capacity Capacity is almost always a concern, um, you know, in the sector and really trying to figure out where and how we put our energy. And so having these strategic partnerships really helps us to manage that. So start early. Um, this, is, this is, I think, a really important um, piece and something that we have, you know, every single year we really take this to heart and, and try to design a program and a process and a timeline um, that's going to make sure that our partners can be the most successful. And so for us, um, you know, Election Day being obviously in November, we know that we really do get the, the, the majority of our contacts in that September, October um, time frame. But in order to be able to have a really strong program running, that really means that we personally try to have our sites up and running um, in August. This year we are trying to have our sites up and running by July. It gives an opportunity, um, one, for us to work out any kinks in the process, for staff to have some practice time, um, if we need to do any retraining, um, then we have time to sort of do all of that. The other piece and, and another real benefit of nonprofits engaging in this work is it is not uncommon that an organization, a staff member, makes the ask and they get a no. But because of the way that it's set up, they're likely that they, they might see that person again. And so they ask again. 
that might still get a no. And we've seen this, and our organizations have told us, that having that consistent presence, having the ability to engage in conversation even over time can really help to shift people's minds and perspectives about whether or not they want to engage. Um, and so giving ourselves and our partners the time to really be able to do that has been um, a really important piece of the puzzle. And so Brian, I think you're going to talk about NVRD. If not, I'm Sorry, happy I was to muted do it. there. Uh, <laughs> okay. Nope, I was muted. I, I started talking and realized I was muted. So, um, yes, uh, this is one of the things that really we saw when we looked at the study. It was one of the one of the biggest variations that we saw between top performing groups and, and low performing groups. Is is 94 percent of top performing groups participated in the uh, National Voter Registration Day event. Um, and for those of you who don't know, it takes place on the fourth uh, Tuesday of every September. Uh, this year that happens on September 25th. Um, and it is a huge national event that brings together, you know, thousands of community groups, nonprofits, libraries, health centers, the kinds of nonprofits we're talking about in these studies, plus universities and, and again, libraries and, and so forth. Um, it also brings together a lot of national broadcast media. We've had engagement from, you know, BET, Univision, CMT, um, uh, along with a lot of digital uh, outfits like, uh, you know, Twitter, Tumblr, uh, Facebook, Google, um, have all done things to promote the holiday. In some cases, putting something on their website. In some cases, putting it on their broadcast channels. But it all basically becomes part of this broad focusing everyone's attention on the need to get registered. Uh, the date September 25th, or well, in this, again, fourth, uh, Saturday, fourth Tuesday of September was chosen because it's, it's before state registration deadlines vary from anywhere from uh, zero in the day, states where you can register on election day to upwards of 30 states that require, or sorry, Upwards of, uh, I think, 16 states require you to register upwards of 30 days in advance of the election. So NVRD is basically a week or so before that. So that um, on National Voter Registration, we really focus and raise awareness on the need for folks to update their registration if they've moved, if they're new to voting, if they've recently naturalized, um, or whatever. Um, we're aiming to register, and I should also add, nonprofit vote is the, well, we, we're, we've been involved in the beginning. There's a lot of organizations involved in this holiday, but really excited to know that uh, we're going to be aiming to register 300,000 voters uh, on National Voter Registration Day in 2018. It's going to be a huge event. And those who sign up, um, you'll, people who sign up as partners get free resources. You get toolkits, guides. Uh, you also get packets of stickers and posters. Uh, so you can see this information at nationalvoterregistrationday.org for more. Great. Um, uh, just a few more best practices that I wanted to, to highlight for folks. So really thinking about um, sort of multiple venues and audiences. So what we do in Colorado is that we work closely with our organizations to help them develop their own unique field plan, which really means that we encourage them to figure out what's going to make the most sense within their organization. We also like to encourage them to think about what it means to extend their efforts into um, the greater communities um, that they work in. Um, and that has also been um, successful because we, we want not just, and we know that when we get the clients engaged that it actually creates something different and a shift in the community because we actually have sort of this increase of voters, we have um, a shift in the dialogue that's happening. Um, and so we oftentimes, and, and we use National Voter Registration Day as a prime opportunity for, the, for them to do that, is to really think about what it means to extend an NVRD event beyond just the walls of their organization, but to make it something that their entire community um, has access to. Um, the last thing that I will talk about, and we have seen this firsthand in Colorado, is that the voter work has oftentimes been 
the lead or the entree point for organizations um, as they begin to think about advocacy in a, broader, in a broader way. One example is that in 2016, we had a brand new organization. Um, it was led entirely the, their effort by staff, so we had a, a really strong staff buy-in. They, as an organization, had been talking for a while about voting, doing something with voting, about trying to dip their toes into advocacy, um, but hadn't really had the chance to move that forward. And so by doing the voter work, it proved to them not only the excitement that staff um, had around doing it, but also their commitment. And it gave them something really tangible to try out and to see how their community would respond based on the experience that they had, the incredible feedback that they had from their clients and from their community. Um, I was honored that later that year, um, I was at their board meeting when they passed their first organizational-wide advocacy plan. Um, and since then, they have been involved in some other of our advocacy capacity building um, work and programs that we offer here at CRC. Um, but we have absolutely found this to be true, that engaging in voter um, efforts can really be the beginning and or really become a part of organizations um, really understanding and being able to do um, some, some broader advocacy work um, as well. So I think that is where I end, and I will toss it back to Brian, I think. I'm actually um, going to take over because I have some questions unless you had something you wanted to add, Brian? Nope. Cool. cool. So I do have quite a few questions. Um, we, are, we do have 10 minutes until the hour. We can keep going with questions after, you know, uh, after our hour is up. Uh, I will do a, a brief closeout for anyone who does have to leave right at the hour, uh, but for now, we'll take some questions. So uh, we have a question. Can you recommend web resources where I can send youth to learn about upcoming issues? The challenge there is issues. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's it I mean it depends on your organization I would I would assume that you would link them to issues that your organization is working on um, that said if you're looking for general voter education about what's on the ballot I mean there are groups that do good um, what's on the ballot um, um, uh, 411 is it 411 vote.org I believe is the URL I might have that wrong uh, that's managed by the League of Women Voters. They try to get some of that ballot information. Um, there's a few groups that do do some, some information about what's on the ballot, about the candidates and stuff like that, if that's the kind of voter engagement, if that's the kind of education you're talking about. Otherwise, I would assume it would be the issues that are of concern to your organization. Thank you. Fred is asking, how can public libraries assist with engaging new voters since staff can't directly get involved in signing up voters? Repeat the question. I'm sorry. How can public libraries assist with engaging new voters since the staff there can't directly be involved in signing up? It sounds like library staff can't be doing That's, voter registration I, themselves. I have never heard of such a thing. That might be a particular library that's prohibiting their staff from doing that, but there's no law that I know of that prohibits staff from doing voter registration. In fact, if anything, they're probably required to under certain, I shouldn't say, a lot of public employee staff are actually required to do voter registration or at least make people aware of it. That's where the whole DMV, uh, the motor vehicle thing, uh, the National Voter Registration Act that required uh, voter registrations be available at all DMVs around the country also applies to a lot of other social services, food stamps and, and other services that are required to at least make voter registration information available, um, if not proactively ask. Um, so I, I, I've, I'm completely unaware of anything that limits a library to that effect. My assumption is anything that's, that's probably a very regional or, or library specific limitation. Yeah, I think, um, you know, in Colorado, we have been in conversation with one of our public libraries trying to figure out what would 
make sense. Um, and a part of what we landed on for this particular library was really around NVRD, um, just because, again, it provides kind of a unique opportunity to do a push. Um, and so, um, I mean, I, I, my understanding is, is similar to Brian's. And so if a library has made the decision that they don't want their staff to be involved, then that is definitely um, an internal decision and less of an actual um, law that they have to follow. But being able to, or you know, offering up their space to hold um, you know, an event for NVRD, what I think would be a great way for a library to be involved. Yeah. And I would add, of the, of the 2,800 or so partners that signed up for NVRD, I think over 200 of them were libraries. So I mean, libraries are a big part of national voter registration. There's libraries all over the country that are doing voter registration, which is why I'm surprised to hear anyone hear that that's the case at any library that would have that such a prohibition. Um, there are, and I should say, there are a handful of um, Head Starts is the one that probably is worth note. Um, Head Start agencies do are one of the few agencies where there's a limitation where you can't do voter registration with those resources, but they can house an external group like a League of Women Voters or um, other such group to do voter registration on their grounds. They just can't use their staff money um, for that. But that's that's a very rare exception for for groups like that. The vast majority of nonprofits and organizations, if anything, they might be required to. Okay. Uh, Andrew would like to know what experience do you all have uh, with having nonprofits offer registration to all new hires as part of the onboarding process, um, making it part of the nonprofit's culture? Yep. Absolutely. And I'll speak to that. I actually sent. Go ahead, Emily. Do you want to take that one? Sorry, <laughs> I think we can maybe both take it. Um, I would there say yes. It's one of the things that we encourage from the get-go um, with all of our organizations is to make sure that they are making the ask internally. And a part of the um, a part of sort of the strategy that we have is around how voter um, engagement efforts really gets integrated into the fabric of our partner organizations. Um, and a part of integrating it um, in that way is making sure that staff can also say, all of our staff is pledged, all of our staff are registered, um, is an incredible way to, um, to show that commitment. And I would add, and I sent out in the Q&A discussion box, you'll see where I sent out a link uh, for something we called Nonprofit Votes Count, which was actually a whole organized campaign we had specifically around getting nonprofit staff to register to vote. Um, and, and exactly as you said, it fosters a culture. That's what it's really about. It may not be that you get massive numbers of people registered, but the act of doing it sends a message about what your organization stands for and it helps establish a culture of civic and voter engagement within the organization. And so it's, it's really a good positive thing to do. We actually have, at that URL I sent, um, we have sample emails from your CEO. Um, we also have tons of buttons and stickers uh, that you can download or ask us about that have like, you know, I work for a nonprofit and I vote. I volunteer at a nonprofit and I vote. And it's all part of that. Uh, effort to really create a culture of nonprofit voting internally, which then gets reflected in your external work. Great, thank you. Um, it's 2:57 here on the East Coast, so I'm going to we're going to stay on the line. But for all of you that can't stay past the hour, uh, we're going to do a little close up now. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that you will receive an email from us with all the links to the webinar recording, materials, and resources mentioned here, including the Engaging New Voters Report, and we'll include a copy of our pledge card for 2018. So my role is to support the staff and volunteers at nonprofits like you to integrate voter engagement into services. So please reach out if you have questions, need help troubleshooting, or have a success story to share. And I just switched the slides, so you'll see right here um, my email. I'm Caitlin Donnelly, and you can email me at caitlin at nonprofitvote.org. I encourage you all to take advantage of the wealth of resources and materials that Nonprofit Vote makes freely available on our website. Whether you want to do a, a voter registration table in your lobby or host a candidate forum to inform your clients and constituents, 
we have resources for you. So we will jump back to questions, and uh, anyone still on the line, you can still keep chatting those at us. Uh, Scott wants to know, how would you address voter registration drives in a state where folks can register to vote the same day as the election? Idaho is such a state, and so we have very low involvement in pre-registration efforts due to this. And Colorado is now such a state, I believe. Is that correct, Emily? Yep. So in Colorado, we have same-day voter registration, um, which has been, of course, great. Um, I, in my experience, that has not hampered our pre-registration. Um, the other piece to Colorado that's important to add to that conversation, though, is that we are a, um, an all-mail-in ballot state as well. So for a lot of folks, um, while there are definitely folks that still choose to you know, go down and, and physically vote on election day, um, everyone in our state does receive a ballot in the mail. So um, for us, getting folks registered you know, kind of throughout, um, throughout the fall has, has worked well, even though we know that folks can still go. And so as we get closer to um, sort of the end of our program, we definitely encourage um, our sites to make sure that people do know and are aware of the fact that they're same-day registration. Um, and then we also include that as part of some of our GOTV information that we give out to folks as well. So it's a nice sort of um, span or scope, right, of all the ways that people can exercise their right to vote um, in our state. Thank you, Emily. Pauline is asking, why aren't voter reg days before primaries encouraged too? Wouldn't voting in a primary get people more interested? Uh, well, I'll say that we do have, uh, we encourage it obviously, and, and your organization can certainly and should, uh, to the extent that you've got the bandwidth, do that, especially if you're in a state that's so deep blue or deep red, that that's really where the real decisions are made anyway, um, that you should do that. Um, some states, I know we've got some states that have done that, some, some local groups that have taken that and run with it. We don't necessarily coordinate that nationally because the problem is the primary dates are different in every state. Um, and so there's no easy way for us to say, here's national vote in your primary registration day because you know, whether you're pro some states are in May, some states are in June, and it, it's just that really has to be done at a state, state by state or even county by county basis. Um, so, so we don't coordinate that, but we certainly encourage it. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Andrew asks, what experience do you have with nonprofits giving employees time off to vote on Election Day Tuesday? Um, I should say I, I will say sorry, ahead, I will say very honestly, I, I wish that we would see more of it. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that would be great. What Emily said. <laughs> I would add though one thing that I found was interesting and, and this is something we've seen a few groups starting to do. Um, it's not time off, but it's actually in some cases maybe it's this is in a different vein. But um the YMCA, we had been in communications with them uh, a couple of years ago about how they could be more supportive of voter engagement. And, and I was really awesomely impressed when they issued this big national order, national press release, whatever, that they were going to offer free child care at all the YMCA affiliate, uh, locations so that people could go and vote. And they did that on Election Day in 2016. I hope they do that again. Um, and we're partnering with a group down in Georgia that's looking to do a similar thing where they're offering free child care for folks who need to go vote. Not sure how impactful that'll be, but it's, it's a nice gesture for one of the challenges that some people have at getting out to the polls. Great. Uh, Kate had a so-called barrage of questions. Um, she asked um, about the staffing, like how many full-time employees the participating agencies had, their budgets, how were they funded, and if they were all 501c3s? 
I'll say that we're all 501c3s. We only work with 501c3s on, um, particularly on this study and a lot of our work. Um, and the budget size, however, and staff size varies substantially. So we've got some of the groups, um, yeah, it, it's hard to say the budget and staff size because uh, at the individual level among those 122 local nonprofits, some of those health centers have hundreds of, have like 100 plus staff. Um, I mean, some of them are big outfits with, with large staffs, but others are, you know, maybe a food pantry that might have, you know, half a dozen people working there. So I think they, they vary substantially um, in staff size and budget for that matter. Yeah, in Colorado, um, aside from health centers, which again are much larger um, entities, we have worked with nonprofits of all sizes. So we've worked with organizations that literally have two staff and you know a handful of volunteers and a very small budget to organizations that have you know 50, 50 staff um, and you know million plus five million plus. Um, budget, and again, I think the the key and a part of what makes this work um, um, successful is that it really is about tailoring the work to each individual nonprofit, um, and we work with them one on one to really figure out who is going to be doing the work within the organization, um, how it's going to be done, so they can do staff planning and figure out staff time and and all of that, um, and then we also um, you know, work with folks to, to make sure that we're providing as much support as possible so that the work that they have to do internally is really just around making that ask, which all of that helps to manage their capacity. Thank you for that insight. Selena wants to know, uh, how do you encourage the cultural gaps to vote? when these certain cultures believe that their rights in the past have been taken away from them? How would private nonprofits encourage these minorities that they do have a right and their voices will be heard if they vote? Here in Hawaii, the Native Hawaiians feel that they don't have a voice and it is hard to encourage these groups to vote. I think that is one of those things where, that goes exactly to that, that feedback loop I was talking about earlier. There may have been something back in history that, and, and some cultural drivers, maybe those explicit policies that barred certain groups to, and there were, well, there were. But, you know, for whatever reason, patterns were set a long time ago that, 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 that we still see today. But the reason we still see it today, the policies may have long since disappeared. The overt barriers may have long since disappeared, but the gaps are still with us because they self-perpetuate for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Campaigns contact people with a history of voting. They don't contact people who don't have a history of voting. And so nonprofits really need to step in and help break that cycle. Um, and I think the second thing I would add is that cultural competency. You know, uh, one, we do work with some groups in Hawaii um, as part of a, particularly a part of a, there's a project we worked with that works with a lot of health centers. And so we worked with a lot of uh, uh, community health centers in Hawaii that are working explicitly with, you know, native Hawaiian populations. And so, yes, that is a challenge, but if you're working with someone who is in that community, and that's, I think that goes to one of the reasons why we think nonprofits are also better suited than say, you know, the parachuting in a bunch of, door knocking canvassers into a community who don't know the community. You know, a nonprofit that's rooted in that community, that's operating that community year round is going to know that community, they're going to know how to talk to that community, and they're going to have trust. And, and it is a long process. And they actually have a graph sitting in front of me right now that I wish I could show and throw up on the PowerPoint. But um, you can actually find it on the census website. It is the voting rates. Uh, by race and Hispanic origin, whatever, 1980 to 2016, and it's that voting pattern over time. And this I mentioned in passing on the call, once upon a time, black voter turnout lagged almost 20 points behind white voter turnout. And that was almost a given. But you can see over the course of about three decades how that has changed. It's not a fast process. It took a long time, but it took a lot of organizing that people did within that community and that, you know, again, so that such that now um, there was a couple of years where black voter, or I think in 12, black voter turnout actually exceeded white voter turnout by, a, by a, about two percentage points or whatever. Um, 
and it fell back behind. But the long and short is that black voter turnout has overall climbed about 15 points relative to the rest of the thing. But we need that same, we still need, there's still a lot of work to do, but I like that graph because it shows that these cultural things are not things we have to accept as permanent fixtures. They can be changed. It takes a long time. It takes concerted efforts, but they can be changed. Thank you, Brian. So we just have a few questions left. Kayla is new to working at nonprofits and doing voter engagement. Her supervisor has encouraged her to get involved in the League of Women Voters, so she's going to be a deputy for on-site signups. But she's wondering if there are some other campaigns um, or initiatives that could help them succeed in their efforts, um, aside from obviously NVRD. Any ideas, Emily or Brian? I mean, I, I tend to point folks to the incredible resources that Nonprofit Vote has um, on their website, which can give some really good, um, uh, not just sort of the research that they've talked about today and that are sharing, but um, good one-pagers about what staff can and cannot do, um, tips, tricks, that kind of thing. So um, to give a nice little plug to NPV, I think that they actually have a really exceptional um, resource uh, library. Well, thank you, Emily. Um, it's better for you to say it than me, but yes, I recommend anyone check out our resources on our website, and um, if you're looking for something specific and can't find it, give me a, a, an email, give us a call, and we can see what we can find for you. And the only thing I would add to that is that um, I would look locally for campaigns because, you know, nationally, again, there's national voter registration and it's definitely something you can anchor into. But I think locally there may be some local efforts that are coordinated within your community, um, whether it's a candidate forum that's being organized by a bunch of different organizations or, um, you know, a debate, wh whatever. There's, there's various things that can, that can take place at the community level, which are things that you can plug into. Um, which are going to be much more local, they're going to be much more impactful from that perspective as well. Great. Well, I think that just about does it. Well, that does do it for our webinar today. Um, any other questions, you can email me. Uh, we really appreciate you, when you log off of the webinar, filling out that survey um, with your feedback. It helps me, it helps our entire team make sure that we're giving you the content that you need in a format that works for you. So, uh, you know, we provide these for free, so this is, that's one way you can give back to Nonprofit Vote is by filling out that survey. Uh, keep checking back the website for more information on future webinars. And I just want to close with really thanking Brian and Emily for being great presenters and answering all these excellent questions from our participants. Thank you, Caitlin, thank you so and thank much. you, Emily. Appreciate it. All right, everybody, have a great afternoon and rest of your week, and uh, hopefully we'll catch you back here in the future for another webinar.